Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar from the People Space on how to unleash your team's productive power. I'm delighted to introduce Eric Garten, co-author of Time, Talent, Energy, a partner at Bain & Company's Chicago office and an expert in organization design and effectiveness. Eric has spoken widely on organizational issues and leads the firm's global organization practice He's also a member of its consumer products and industrial goods and services practice. Time, Talent, Energy presents new research into how businesses can liberate people's time, their talent and their energy, and in doing so, unleashing organizations' productive power. With today's focus on productivity and increased scarcity of talent, the book couldn't be more timely, and it offers some great insight and solutions to organizational drag, which we'll hear about later. So hopefully, if tech uh, gremlins permit, we're over to you, Eric. Thank you very much for your time today. I'd like to actually start our conversation about workforce productivity by pulling the camera lens back a little bit and talking about productivity more broadly. And let me start by saying that driving productivity growth at both the macro, that is sort of the country level or at the firm level, is something that's very difficult to do over a long period of time. In fact, if you look at the data we have on this chart, you can see that only about one in 11 companies are what we call sustained value creators. Now these are companies uh, that are above $500 million in revenue and they have to meet three criteria. They have to be able to grow their top line and their bottom line at roughly twice the rate of GDP growth in their countries. And that might sound heroic, but in reality that's only about five to five and a half percent real growth per year. They have to do that over a 10 year basis while also covering their cost of capital. Now, we've been tracking companies for the last 30 years with this metric, and as I said earlier, only about 1 in 11 companies are able to do this on a sustained basis. And guess what? It gets harder as you get bigger. In fact, we looked at the 3,400 companies that comprise the S&P Total Stock Market Index, and we looked at the relationship between the size of the company and a metric around productivity. In this case, it's profit per employee. And you can see that these two factors are negatively related. In fact, for every 10% increase in the size of your workforce population, typically you suffer about 2% decline in productivity per employee. So that's the beginning of the story. Uh, it's difficult to grow companies, it's difficult to grow countries, and it gets harder as you get bigger. So when we look at what allows companies to grow on a sustained basis, uh, it's interesting to think about the way economists think about it. Uh, they typically describe three factors when they're talking about workforce productivity. The first factor is what they call capital deepening, and that's the amount of capital we put for every dollar of labor. And the more capital you put against labor, the more productive your labor is. The second factor is education, and that's typically a measure that's correlated with the quality of your workforce. The more upskilled they are, the more productive they are. And then there's this last factor that economists talk about, which is total factor productivity. And this is essentially kind of a residual or a catch-all factor, but it's usually correlated with breakthroughs in innovation and technology. Now, this is a snapshot of 125 years of U.S. history. And if you look at the, the middle part of this graph, the period of 1920 to 1970, this is the breakout period of growth in the United States. And you can see the top two factors, education and total factor, factor productivity or innovation, were the key drivers of growth during this period of time. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's the, the top two factors are really all about human capital, not financial capital. And it shouldn't be surprising if you think about it. A single idea can pro propel a company for a very long period of time. Think about uh, Apple's iPhone or Amazon's web services, or even maybe a little bit uh, less well-known, something like Continental Resources, who helped create the horizontal drilling technologies that make fracking possible which have changed the nature of the oil and gas industry around the globe. Now these ideas don't materialize out of thin air. They come from people who have the time and the talent and the energy to think creatively about the work they do every day. Now, maybe just one last thing I would mention here, if you look at that concept of capital deepening, it's remarkable how consistent the contribution has been from financial capital over the last 125 years of US history. You get roughly 60 basis points of growth year in, year out uh, across this period of time. Now, it would take uh, more than 100 years at 60 basis points for GDP per capita to double in an economy. So unless you can unlock human capital, you have no hope of growing your, your companies or your countries on a sustained basis. And that led us to sort of an interesting paradox. 
uh, we're all taught either on the job or in business school that strategy is about the allocation of scarce resources. And for most of modern history, the scarcest resource has been financial capital. Uh, that's no longer true. Financial capital today is relatively abundant. We estimate that by the year 2010, financial capital will be roughly 20 times, or sorry, 10 times global GDP. Uh, and it's relatively cheap on a historical basis as well. For most of our large clients, the after-tax cost of borrowing is below their rate of inflation. So financial capital, which was once quite scarce and always carefully managed, is actually relatively abundant and relatively cheap, yet it's still very carefully managed. Boards of management care about it, executives care about it, shareholders care about it, and we have all sorts of three and four letter acronyms for measuring it. Now let's contrast that with human capital. Human capital is truly scarce. If you think of time, no amount of money can buy a 25 hour workday. Or think of talent, it's so scarce, sometimes we say we even fight a war for it. Or energy, in spite of decades of investing and trying to drive higher levels of workforce engagement, most companies remain mired in a very stagnant level of engagement inside of their workforce. And then think about how we manage human capital. It's typically managed with much less rigor, in part because it doesn't sit on our balance sheet, and in part because it's very difficult to manage. So this is the paradox. Financial capital, relatively abundant, relatively cheap, and very carefully managed. Human capital, always scarce, always finite, and not managed with the same level of discipline as financial capital. We believe the best companies in the future and the best CEOs of those companies are going to be equally good at managing human capital as they have been historically at managing financial capital. So we set out to understand what great companies are doing. And of course, as consultants, we need to have an equation. So we came up with the workforce productivity formula. Like economists, we break it down into three factors, time. These are the number of hours you have to put into your job every day. Talent. These are the skills, capabilities, and ingenuity that we bring to our work and energy. This is what allows us to bring focus, engagement, passion to our workplace every day. And in our equation, we start first by saying, let's take a, an average productivity company and let's subtract from that average company uh, the factors of organizational drag. And by that, we mean all of the things that conspire to take time away from people inside of a company. It could be a complex organizational structure. It could be inefficient ways of working. It could be unproductive cultures uh, that have institutionalized ways of working that rob people of precious time. Think of the meetings that shouldn't have happened, the email that shouldn't have been sent, the decision that took too long to make. Those are all examples of organizational drag. Then we add back to that uh, loss from organizational drag what we gain in having great people who are well deployed, well teamed, and exceptionally well led. And then we add further back to that loss from organizational drag uh, the benefit we get from inspiring and engaging our workforce so that they can bring their full selves to work every day. So we had to put some data behind our equation. We worked with the Economist Intelligence Unit, the research arm of the Economist, and we interviewed over 300 companies on their workforce management practices. And the results of this research were pretty interesting. We grouped the companies into two groups. The first group was the best. This was the top quartile in our sample. The other group were the bottom three quartiles, which we called the rest. Uh, the most interesting and obvious insight from this research is that the best really are a lot more productive than the rest, probably not surprisingly, but it's a significant difference. We found that the best companies were roughly 40% more productive than the average of the bottom three quartiles. And if you think about what that means in practical terms, that means by Thursday at around 10 o'clock in the morning, one of the best companies will have gotten as much done as one of the rest of the companies will have gotten done in their entire work week. And of course, the best companies don't stop working Thursday at 10 o'clock. They work the rest of Thursday. They work on Friday. And this is how, over time, the best companies really put a big gap between them and their performance and the poor performance of a company in the bottom three quartiles. In fact, if you think about this, over a 10-year period, if you're generating that much more productive output each year, you're going to generate 30 times more output than a company in the bottom three quartiles. And this is one of the principal reasons that we see around the globe in pretty much every industry, the top two or three companies control about 80% of the profit pools in their industry because they're human capital outliers. Now, just for a moment, let's drill down on the rest. If you look at how they perform, they lose about 25% of their productive capacity to organizational drag, and they just barely get back to break even by how they manage their talent and how they inspire their workforce. So they just barely get back to 100% productive output. Contrast that with the best companies. 
the best companies cut their organizational losses from drag in half versus the rest of the companies. They gained 25 uh, points from improvement in how they manage the talent in their workforce. And finally, they get another six points in terms of how they engage and inspire their workforce so their employees can bring their full selves to work today. And this is what separates the best companies from the rest. I want to share with you now just a few insights from the research that we've done, and I'm going to take a moment and talk about each of time, talent, and energy separately. Let me start with time. When we drilled down on this and looked at the human capital outliers, we saw a lot of factors that were causing organizations to lose productivity productive capacity to organizational drag. And I'm going to work from right to left in this picture. I think the first thing we saw is companies that lacked a high resolution strategy suffered greater organizational drag losses than others, in large part because it's your strategy and the clarity of that strategy that provide direction and guidance to your workforce on how to get their jobs done most effectively. And when there isn't a strong compass that guides those choices and decisions they're making, you tend to have not only lower productivity in an organization, uh, but you have a company that tends to lose its way in pursuit of trying to serve customers. The, the second set of factors we saw were around lack of skills and capabilities. Now, most organizations are going through pretty significant transformations, and the nature of skills we need in our workforce are changing dramatically, whether it's big data and advanced analytics and statistical capabilities, or it's digital technologies and digital capabilities, or it's learning how to manage partnerships that cut across an ecosystem. Uh, all of these are capabilities that are in short supply today in most companies. And if you lack those skills, those capabilities, it makes an organization much more productive. And at the macroeconomic level, it creates a lot more structural unemployment. The third set of factors that we looked at were around collaboration and culture. And here we saw that the best companies were very good at building ways of working that institutionalized high performance cultures. And the weaker companies had institutionalized ineffective ways of working. And by that I mean things like uh, meeting management protocols or communications protocols or how you go about making decisions. Or importantly, how you think about having a culture and whether it's gonna be principles driven or rules driven. And especially important, how you think about learning over time. Your ability to use test and learn techniques, to take risk as an enterprise and learn from taking those risks. And then the last set of factors we saw are probably the root cause, many of these issues are organizational complexity. As companies get bigger and reach for growth and try to create repeatability and scalability, they often become much more complex hierarchical organizations with too many layers and low spans of control that tend to institutionalize a lot of these downstream problems related to organizational drag. The best companies we saw systematically fought these natural forces of organizational drag. They had a high resolution strategy. They designed an operating model that was zero based that tried to make sure that uh, interactions between their employees were as efficient and effective as possible. And they built a high performance culture to reinforce that. Let me now switch to the second of the three factors in our equation, a talent. Uh, let me first start by saying that we know and probably the most obvious observation in our research is that not all talent are created equal. In fact, we looked at a variety of industries, and we found that, that uh, a very high-quality, high-skilled person in the same job in the same industry could be anywhere from two to ten times as productive as an average person in that same role in that same industry. So obviously, job number one for executives and job number one for the HR function is to find what we call difference-making talent, because they do have an outsized performance on the overall uh, performance of your company. Uh, but what was interesting in our research was we found that there wasn't that much of a difference in terms of the composition of talent across companies. In fact, the best companies uh, would say about 16% of their workforce would be what they would call a talent. And by that, we mean sort of the best in their industry, not just in their company. While the rest of the companies, the bottom three quartiles, estimated that roughly 14% of their workforce would be a talent. Now, of course, these are self-assessments, so there could be some great inflation, especially at the bottom end of the spectrum. But it does sort of match our intuition uh, that the best companies, while they do have uh, a, a larger portion of the workforce that is a talent, that's not typically how they're driving out performance uh, in terms of talent. It's how they manage those people. And this is what was really insightful about this piece of research. We found that the best companies 
were purposely inegalitarian in terms of how they matched people to position. They understood deeply where the mission critical roles were in their company, and they were very purposeful in making sure that their top talent ended up in those mission critical roles. While we saw a more democratic approach uh, in, in the bottom three quartiles of the companies, they tend to distribute talent across the organization based on this notion that if they put uh, a top talent in this part of the company and a top talent in that part of the company, uh, by sprinkling them around, they'll raise the average level of performance uh, of the entire company. We found that concentrating your talent against your business critical roles, your mission critical initiatives, gave you a much higher return on your talent. And that leads to the third factor, energy. Now, energy is probably the most nebulous of the three factors that we talk about in, in our workforce productivity formula. But I think we all know what it's like to walk into a high energy place uh, and what it's like to walk into a low energy workplace where you feel like your soul is being sucked out of you every day. Uh, ultimately, the source of energy is inspired employees. Uh, and we like to say organizational energy, unlike physical energy, is not bound by the first law of thermodynamics, which says energy is neither created nor destroyed. Uh, great companies create energy every day, and weaker companies destroy employee energy every day. So if energy comes from inspired employees, uh, we believe that uh, inspiration exists along a spectrum, from deeply dissatisfied to fully inspired. And our research sort of validates that as you rise in this inspiration hierarchy, you get increased productivity from your employees. So employees that are merely satisfied are roughly 40% more productive than an employee who is dissatisfied thinking about their next step. An employee who is engaged, that next level in our hierarchy, is roughly 45% more productive than a merely satisfied employee. And an inspired employee, someone who's truly engaged by their work every day in a deep way, is 55% more productive than an engaged employee. Now these factors are multiplicative. So an inspired employee would be more than three times as productive as an employee who's thinking about their next step. Uh, unfortunately, only about one in eight employees are inspired, uh, even in the best of the companies that we looked at. Our model for how you build inspiration, just like our model for inspiration itself, is hierarchical in nature. And here we draw our inspiration from Abraham Maslow, whose famous hierarchy sort of suggests that you can't worry about a higher order need until you've satisfied a lower order need. And in our hierarchy, we talk about the lower order needs are what we call the qualifiers. Employees have to have a physically and emotionally safe working environment. They have to have the tools and resources to do their job well. They have to feel like they can get their job done efficiently and they aren't walking through quicksand every day to get their job done. And they have to feel like they're fairly valued and rewarded for their contribution. Not that they're equally rewarded, but that the principles of reward are fair and objective. If you get those factors right, and most companies work very hard at that, you'll have a satisfied employee. If you want to get to the next level of engagement, you have to reach into what we call the intrinsic motivators. Employees have to have autonomy to do their job well. If they feel like they're being micromanaged, uh, that's not very motivating. They need to be connected to an extraordinary team. There's nothing as motivating as going to work every day surrounded by talented colleagues who push you to be your best. They have to feel like they can learn and grow in their job with the opportunity to achieve mastery and they have to see how their work impacts what the company's trying to achieve. If you get those four factors right, you'll have a pretty engaged employee uh, and you start to see and get access to their discretionary energy. If you wanna to get to that next level and truly inspire your employees, you have to do two more things. They have to understand how their job uh, touches and connects to the company's higher purpose and meaning. It has to be something beyond the work content itself that they personally believe in, and they have to be able to see how their job contributes to that purpose. And lastly, they have to be inspired by the leaders in their company. Leaders have an outsized role uh, in creating an inspirational working environment. Now, we like to say to have a truly inspired employee, they have to both love the content of the work and the company they're doing the work for. One without the other doesn't work. If you love the work that you're doing but not your company, you're a hostage. If you love your company but not the work you're doing, you're probably a retention risk. It's the bottom two layers in our pyramid that ensure that you love your work and the content of your job, and it's the top layer in our pyramid that ensure that you love the company you're doing it for. And that leads to the third factor in our equation, uh, energy. Let me, let me close with um, just a few thoughts of what we saw in terms of 
companies that were human capital outliers, uh, the, the most important thing we saw that they were doing was they shifted from an efficiency mindset to a productivity mindset. Now this may just sound like wordplay, but what we mean by that, an efficiency mindset, you're focused on getting the same done with fewer resources. And most managers are very skilled at figuring that out. A productivity mindset is how do we get more done with the same set of resources. And as companies want to shift uh, to being growth-oriented companies, they have to shift from an efficiency to a productivity mindset. And in order to do this, we saw three principles at work. First, they treat time like a finite resource, where every hour has a real opportunity cost, just like every dollar has an opportunity cost. Second, they treat talent and employees like assets as opposed to expenses. If you think of an employee as a factor of production, that sits on your income statement in the form of an expense, you'll try to do with it what you do with every factor of production or every expense. You try to minimize uh, the use of that expense and maximize what you get out of it. If instead you think of employees like assets, you treat them as something like uh, that you're trying to invest to get the highest return uh, on them and make the highest and best use of them. And that's a different mindset when it comes to talent. You'll ensure that your greatest talent is in difference making uh, mission critical roles. And finally, on energy, you have to aim higher for inspiration, not just for engagement, if you really want to access the discretionary energy of your employees. Great. Thanks very much, um, Eric. That was uh, uh, really um, lacking in organizational drag. Very productive indeed. <laughs> um, managed to get through an awful lot in, in that short time. Um, now, we've got some, some questions. I'm actually going to start with uh, picking up a, a couple myself, um, if that's OK with you. Um, sure. you, you talked um, a lot about the fact that there's less rigor when it comes to sort of human capital uh, management versus sort of financial. Um, are you actually seeing any increased focus on on the value of human capital from like investors in that community, um, or or is this something we talk about quite a lot, but it still isn't isn't hitting through to the to the people who actually matter, the investors. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think probably one of the best places to look for evidence of that mattering uh, is with private equity clients. Uh, we do a lot of work with private equity firms around the world. And I have seen over the last several years uh, a real increased emphasis on making sure when they're doing their diligence on an asset that they not only understand the capabilities of the senior leadership team, but they more fundamentally understand how the organization operates. Uh, and so in their diligence, they're trying to make sure that they're buying companies that have healthy organizations that maximize the value of their human capital in terms of getting the most out of the time, talent, energy of their workforce. And, and in large part, this is because the holding periods for these companies have increased significantly. Uh, and they know that they're going to have to have dynamic organizations that can adapt over time. Uh, if you were just to buy a company and flip it quickly, you worry less about long-term organizational health, but given the changes in the way private equity firms create value, uh, they put a lot more emphasis on a deeper understanding of that. So I think that's kind of a leading indicator of how like very uh, progressive uh, investors are thinking about human capital. What, what, what sort of measures are they um, looking at and, um, and, and sort of how are, how are they seeing it? You talked about it doesn't sit on the balance sheet. Can you ever see it sitting on the balance sheet? <laughs> No, I think it will always be a little bit difficult to measure it as concretely as you would, you know, financial flows. Uh, but they're looking at things like, you know, the level of engagement and inspiration in the workforce. They're trying to understand how the leadership team itself uh, creates an environment uh, that's productive inside of the company. So instead of just diligencing individual leaders and looking at their resumes, they're also trying to understand how that team works together in a more collaborative way to manage the enterprise. Uh, I think they're looking deeper at longer term factors that are associated with the organizational health, uh, things like organizational drag. And so they're doing in diligence a more comprehensive assessment of the organization. I, I do think there are metrics we can use to improve the understanding of that. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk a little bit about, you know, some of the tools that are out there, like Microsoft uh, has this tool called in workforce analytics. Uh, used to be called volumetrics, but it allows you to measure where time goes in an organization. Uh, when it comes to talent, I think one of the most telling measures, which we haven't seen companies put into place yet, but I think they over time could, 
is looking at how effective leaders are at uh, what I call the kind of talent trade balance. So how much talent do they import into their group and how much talent do they export from their group? And you want to reward managers who have a positive trade balance. Uh, and then I think lastly, I have seen a number of companies put in measures around inspirational leadership. Uh, there's some interesting work, you know, at companies like Google and Kronos uh, and Netflix where they specifically are measuring a couple times a year uh, based on upward feedback, the level of inspiration in their leadership uh, and are recognizing and rewarding people for that because they realize the outsized impact leaders have on organizational energy. So I think we will over time add more sophisticated measures to how we manage human capital. That, that's really interesting. Um, your research finds that um, I think it was the average company engages about a third of the workforce, if I remember, and there's around a tenth that are completely dissatisfied. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of debate on on the effectiveness of uh, engagement strategies, um, especially especially over here, but I've seen it in the states as well. Um, and uh, your research seems to um, to add to that that not much has really changed, despite huge amounts of investment going here. Um, yeah, my, I sort of feel sometimes HR is a bit resistant to even considering that engagement may not be working the way it should be, because I think it's one of those areas they do think they have got a, a metric, some form of measurement to uh, to take to the top table. Um, but do you, you know your idea of inspiration rather than engagement? Do you think we need to rip up the rule book on engagement? I think that we need to fundamentally rethink what we're trying to do to drive engagement. I think the, the measures themselves are not terrible. If you, I mean, I think there are some good metrics out there, although I do think that often we focus, you know, maybe not high enough in terms of the aspiration. We, we say aim higher for inspiration and you'll have a greater chance of engaging a larger portion of your workforce. But I think we haven't got to the root cause of why workers find it difficult to engage in their work every day. And often the solutions we put in place are too superficial. Uh, they're focused on you know, perks and benefits. Uh, they don't often get down to fundamentally what allows someone to engage in their work and bring their full selves to work every day. And I think that requires a deeper reflection on the way we design jobs um, and, and the way we build an environment in which people uh, do their job every day. And I think those are harder things to deal with. And so we mm -hmm. tend, as I say, to deal with the more superficial drivers of engagement and not the more substantial ones that really, really impact how people uh, show up for work every day. Yeah, yeah. We've, ha we've had an interesting um, comment um, in relation to focusing too much on time and productivity. And would that mean that uh, we focus on, on too much on the short term sort of tangible benefits rather than the things that longer term make a real difference? Um, and if you look at some of the uh, companies you've mentioned, um, it's the sort of creativity and innovation which um, that they're known for. And that takes some some time. Um, so, you know, is, is, is it a bit too much of a focus actually on on sort of productivity? I, I might say it a little bit different. I, I think the way we think about it is often there's too much focus maybe on efficiency versus productivity. Yeah. And when we think about efficiency, we always think about how do you get, you know, the same done with less resource. Uh, and many managers and many organizations are quite adept at doing that. It's typically not that hard to figure out how to use fewer inputs and get more out of it. Uh, there are limits to that, but that's something that most managers are well trained in and it's a little bit more intuitive. It's harder to figure out how to take the same level of resource and get more out of it. Uh, and, that, and that's a productivity mindset. So I think we do need a productivity mindset and we often erred on the side of too much focus on the denominator and efficiency and not, not enough focus on the numerator and the output. Uh, mm -hmm. And the best companies I do think have a longer term perspective uh, when they think about driving productivity. So I do think there is an issue with short-termism uh, that can affect how we manage organizational uh, efficiency and energy. Yeah, maybe uh, as that person says, we need a human capital mindset <laughs> as well as the productivity mindset. I, I think that's right. I think the best companies realize that over time, uh, what's gonna make a difference in allowing their company to outperform is that they have built a place that attracts great talent and unleashes that talent 
to do their job with excellence every day. And if they keep that mindset in everything that they do, I think they'll get rewarded in the long run, uh, irrespective of the industry they participate in and the intrinsic growth rate of that industry. I think we can look across industries that have very different characteristics and we still find winners and losers. And I think at the heart of winning is almost always how they think about managing human capital. Is there um, some, somebody sent in a, a question to me in advance of this, um, wondering whether there was any evidence that um, companies with more sort of pro what you'd call productive workforces deal better in in down times. In um, I guess maybe thinking about what might be coming ahead in in Britain, <laughs> um, but but are there is there any evidence that supports that they're they're better um, in in the sort of business downturn? Uh, that is a good question and not one that I've, you know, studied deeply, but I have to believe, you know, intuitively the companies that uh, have built these more autonomous, higher energy, more productivity oriented work environments, find ways to uh, thrive, you know, or at least survive even in downturns. Uh, they just tend to be more flexible and adaptive organizations. I think recessions or downturns often reveal, uh, uncover the weaknesses of companies that haven't built that kind of an organization. And they're typically the ones that suffer the most in downturns because uh, those are difficult times and they don't ha have as adaptive or flexible or as engaged of a workforce. Uh, and I think they're the ones honestly that perform less well, although I don't have any empirical evidence to prove that. Okay. There's, is there a, a sort of a dichotomy about using the words productivity, which we think about in terms of work um, and and um, actually the whole people part? Um, so somebody's made the point about could it be that um, people aren't engaged because productivity feels about the work rather than the person? I think that people, when it comes to work, you know, they want to accomplish something. They want to create an output of some sort. And so I think when we think about productivity in that sense, which is what allows us to take our skills and talent and energy and produce something that is useful for the company, useful for society, I think, you know, in that language, productivity is, you know, an empowering concept. Uh, it, is, it isn't about, uh, you know, driving more, you know, EBITDA to the bottom line, although that's a byproduct of more productive organizations. So I don't think there's in, anything inherently in conflict with thinking about an individual maximizing their full potential and an organization being highly productive. I think the two are highly uh, correlated. Right. Yeah. Um, one, uh, somebody's talked about, uh, you mentioned in, uh, in, the in the slide about talent, um, I think it was that, um, that uh, having difference making talent is really the most important thing for a, for a business. Um, do you have any tips on how you can make, you, you can sort of uh, get to difference making talent and um, any examples of companies you think are doing that particularly well? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. You can, uh, the, there's some powerful things you can do with, with uh, tools like LinkedIn where you can look at talent flows between companies uh, and you can see what type of talent, what level of talent uh, in terms of seniority, the quantity of talent that's flowing between companies. And I do think you see companies that are talent magnets and companies that uh, are losing their talent over time. So I, I, I think you can see the flows uh, today with some of the modern tools that we have. In terms of finding great talent, there, is, there are a lot of interesting new companies out there that are playing around with these ideas of how do you uh, identify, if you will, the, the sort of what we call the behavioral signature of high performing individuals or difference makers. And are there ways to test for that in the recruiting processes and then ways to nurture and develop that once they're you know, part of your organization? There's a company in London called the Chemistry Group, which does some interesting stuff here that it's part art, part science in defining what they call what great looks like. And I think there's another company, Sine Quanon, that we've worked with in the past too, that develops what they call a performance signature. And in both cases, they believe fundamentally that the difference making talent is bespoke to the company, to its strategy, its culture, its operating model, the context of the company, its industry. And you need to use techniques to define exactly what that winning 
performance signature is for your company, and you can use data to do that uh, and more sophisticated techniques. So I do believe there's some pioneering work going on at a lot of companies trying to figure out how to do this uh, more effectively. Great. We, we seem to be having quite interesting um, discussions in our private area, <laughs> um, but do please put your, your question forward um, publicly, uh, anyone out there, as we've got about 10 more minutes to go. Um, one phrase you said that I wanted to pick up on, actually, which I thought was interesting, was the purposely inegalitarian. Um, again, it's sort of the type of words that seem to go against the grain a little for many HR professionals, I think, um, particularly as we talk a lot about um, moving away from the idea that only certain people are talent. Um, you know, I just was interested in, in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I guess a, a couple of thoughts. I mean, I don't think... Um, people believe that they need, you know, I've seen a lot of research on this. I think that individuals don't, they need to think they're being treated fairly, but not necessarily uh, equally in the sense that people understand that there are, we have different strengths and weaknesses, different attributes, different levels of commitment, and that our effort should get rewarded proportion to our contribution. I, I think that most people believe that. Uh, but they they want to believe that the rules of the game are unbiased and that they have as much of an opportunity as anyone else to excel in that environment. So I don't think you, from an individual perspective, have to be egalitarian. I think you have to be fair and transparent. But when it comes to talent, not just rewarding talent, recognizing it for what it's done, one of the common mistakes we see in companies is just this notion that I'm going to take my my top performers, and most companies are decent at defining that, although not perfect. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, weaknesses in some of the common you know nine box systems for determining potential of individuals. But let's say the companies were were good at determining who their high talent were. They often tend to distribute that talent uh, with the notion that if I put a, a star person here and a star person over there and a star person over there. I'll raise the average level of performance across the company. And we find that that tends to dilute the impact of talent, that you're better to concentrate your talent against your most important missions and roles. Uh, and that often you need to be, think very deeply about your particular strategy and operating model and where those unique pivot points are in your model where having difference makers in them will make a difference for the company and doing mm -hmm. a good job of matching uh, those mission critical roles with difference making talent and we see mismatches in that all the time as well. I've got a, a great question here. Um, is there, what, what's the one thing that you see that wastes people's time the most in organizations? Yeah, I, I get, I think it probably does come down to how they use meetings and, and various forms of communications in order to make decisions. I find so many companies uh, the, the decision velocity in their company is slowed down as accountabilities get diffused. Um, as we move to more autonomous and agile organizations, sometimes we lose the benefit of hierarchy. One thing hierarchy is very good at is chains of command and decision authority. Uh, and I see a lot of companies as they move to more, you know, uh, distributed models struggle to make decisions quickly. And they tend to revisit decisions a lot. Uh, and they tend not to have the right burden of proof for when they should take action. Uh, there's a conservatism that sort of uh, impedes these organizations. And I love the way that Jeff Bezos and Amazon talks about the difference between a day one and a day two organization. And one of the key metrics they use is decision velocity. And when you think about decisions, you need to determine whether they have a one way or a two way door, as he says. If a decision is reversible, you want to make that decision quickly, learn from it, and adjust. If a decision is truly irreversible, then you need to measure twice, cut once mentality. And I think companies get those motions mixed up, and um, as a result, the, they, they, the decision speed of a company dramatically slows down, and they have to have more meetings and more communications to get an action or decision taken. And that's where we see you know, drag at its highest. Mm. And uh, that actually leads quite nicely into into this, because obviously um, there's been a uh, huge growth in the use of, of tools like email. Um, as we move more into this collaborative world, um, someone's asking about 
uh, that they've got loads of different tools coming into their workplace to enable collaboration. But uh, could we get to the point where actually those tools themselves start to cause some of the drag? <laughs> In other words, an overload from the new tools. <laughs> No, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the a lot of these tools make collaboration, at least initiating a collaboration, costless. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything to add another person onto an email distribution or a text or a chat. It doesn't cost you anything to set up a meeting through Outlook. Now, participation in those things can be quite costly. They consume valuable time. So the initiation of collaboration has become almost costless and frictionless, but the, but the cost of collaboration has grown. And so I do believe that you have to do smart collaboration and you have to have organizations that channel people uh, into more efficient uh, ways of interacting because um, it used to be that the cost of calling the meeting or getting people together or having the communication was enough of a burden that you thought carefully about what you were doing in the first place. As those costs have gone down, you initiate all sorts of collaborations without thinking about whether they're necessary. And I think that we have to have a, a behavioral change uh, to manage these new technologies. I think the technologies are great. Uh, they allow for much more real time, uh, much more distributed models, but unmanaged, they could become, as you say, quite problematic. A, a lot of this comes down to the uh, the traditional issue, which is about leadership, of course. Um, do you see, have you seen since talking about um, uh, this and, and the release of the book um, in, in the last year, uh, are leaders taking this on? Are you getting more um, buy-in from the CEO community? You know, is there anyone you think is, is really pushing the boat out here? I have found this topic, you know, and I've given this, had this discussion with, you know, many, many large companies around the globe over the last year. And uh, A, it resonates with the leadership teams. And B, I see many of them have in particularly taken on this notion that they are responsible for building an organization uh, that is a, a low drag environment and an inspiring environment. And especially on the inspiring piece, I have met a lot of leadership teams that are fundamentally recommitting uh, to that. They believe inspiration is in the reach of all of their executives and they're holding themselves accountable. Uh, I'm not really at liberty to mention specific companies because often these are private conversations, but I see great uptake on, on these topics. Okay, and um, we've only really got time for one last question, and I'm, I'm not surprised this has raised its head. Um, but there's a question, do you see organizational drag improving when more artificial intelligence comes into the working environment, or do you think it will make no difference? <laughs> I, do, I do think it will make a profound difference uh, in terms of increasing you know, uh, organizational efficiency and reducing drag, because I think it will just bring data to bear uh, on problems that sometimes are clouded by lack of quality information or, or well-sorted information. So I think artificial intelligence and deep machine learning, et cetera, can have a profound impact on, on organizational uh, effectiveness and re reducing drag. We know the counterpart of that is uh, we've got to figure out how humans and artificial intelligence are gonna interact in ways that uh, you know, are going to be uh, you know, uh, long-term, sustainable and, and effective ways to run organizations and there's also other disruptive forces coming from AI, but I see it mostly as a positive as opposed to a negative thing. Great. Well, I think there's a whole other webinar we could do on the, on that. But thank you very much. We've come to the end of our uh, 45 minutes. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Eric. Uh, very, very productive indeed. Got through an awful lot there and um, just makes me uh, want to uh, want to continue the conversation. So perhaps we can have you back for a second. <laughs> That'd be my uh, pleasure. Thank you very much.